Glad to be back. <laughs> there was some there was some doubt about that. I understand. Let me say uh, first off how much I have enjoyed my six weeks with you all. It's been the longest I've ever been up here, and it's been really really good for me. You all are responsive and interesting people, and I'm, I'm always glad to have both of those. I thought last night I was fooling around with my iPad that I would look up on Amazon and see if the church directory for Fourth Presbyterian is being sold on Amazon. No luck. But I've been thinking the last couple of weeks I'd love to get my hands on one. I should ask Mike about that so I can know you all by name a little bit better than I do. But thank you for everything. And I, oh, sweet. Can Can you spare that? Now everybody bring up and let's take a quick picture. <laughs> Thank you. You can get it on your iPad. Yeah, but I want pictures. I want to see. Let them get the oh, I think are they is They're it online. Okay, yeah. all right. Thank you. Good. Good. I just come. I wish I could. And I love you all daily, but eighty miles has been a little tough some Sunday. Um Let's begin with prayer. Dear God, we are grateful for this community that binds us together. Please strengthen it and make it more your people so that we might speak to the world of the meaning of our faith. Help us in our study this morning that we might see a way, a better way perhaps to do that. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, I bought a Bible with me because I did not put one of these scripture passages in the book and I need to go back to it. Last week we talked about the uh, stoning of Stephen, Stephen's martyrdom. (laughs) Sorry folks, I'm not coming that way. We talked about Stephen's martyrdom and we talked about uh, Peter going and converting Cornelius, the first Gentile that was a... um, was a member of the Christian church. But there's an interesting verse right at the stoning of Stephen that I did not talk about last week and I wanted to read it to you. This is in chapter 8 of Acts. That day, the day of Stephen's martyrdom, that day a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Now, we talked last week about how scattering the church. Uh, is any, should I get further away or back up? Oh, I'm taller. <laughs> That's nice. Is that better? Somebody has a bet out here about whether I'm going to collapse. Can you work it? That's fine. Turn it down a little bit. That's what I want. Um, Cornelius was converted by Peter. Now, the interesting thing and the strange thing is that sentence where it says, all but the apostles, all but the apostles were scattered. Well, why were the apostles there? How could they stay? These are the, these are the head honchos, so to speak of the church and they remain in Jerusalem and everybody else runs for the hills. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me until you look at this. Careful, careful. Okay. Remember how I said there were three types of uh, Jews actually, but also where the Christian church came from. There were the old fashioned Jews who could certainly be Christians without any problem. The second group were the Hellenists, and these were the Greeks who had become members of the Jewish faith by being circumcised, going through the painful exercise, and so in effect being Jews, they could go to the temple, they could do all of that. And the third group are called God-fearers, and these God-fearers were people that followed the Christian faith but had not gone through any of the rituals to make themselves Jews. Now, if we want to know a God-fearer, we've met one, Cornelius. He was an Italian of all things. 
I don't know if they had Italians back then or not. They were Romans, I guess. But he was from Italy. And so he certainly wasn't a Jew. And he was, you know, the Holy Spirit came down and they spoke in tongues. And so that's when Peter baptized him in the story. The people that had to flee were the Hellenists. If you were a Jew, a total Jew, and had become a Christian, they didn't touch you in this persecution. What they were after were these foreigners, these Greeks, who had been circumcised and were causing all this trouble. Therefore, they executed Stephen, and they went out and chased out all the Hellenists. Now, what do you think that does? That means that the missionary effort of the church was going to be led by Hellenists. And they were much more open and inclusive because of their own role than the Jewish Christians were. And so you see that in effect they handed over the missionary endeavor to um, these Greeks. I like Greeks. I just thought I'd throw that in. Everybody, everybody understand that? Because now we're going to go and uh, spend the rest of the time talking about Paul and his conversion and how that works. So on your sheets, you have the scripture passages for that. And we will read parts and parcels of those. It says, meanwhile, Saul still breathing. This is Acts 9, 1 through 9. Saul, still breathing breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus. Now, you see the red letters there. Those were the three characteristics that always marked Saul or Paul. He was absolutely a Jew. He was born a Jew, circumcised on the eighth day. He had been raised a Pharisee, which was a strict legalist, who, and they hated, ultimately, came out against the Christians, although they were friendly at first. They came out against the Christians because they violated the religious laws of Judaism. And then most important of all, maybe, Paul was a Roman citizen. We don't know how he got to be a Roman citizen, but he had the gold card or the platinum card. And he could use that card if he got into trouble because Roman citizens, if you had Roman citizenship, you were legally protected in ways that other people would not be. So he was going to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus. So that if he found any who belonged to the way, now I want you to see that phrase, to the way was how Christians knew themselves. If you were a member of the earliest Christian church, you didn't call yourself a Christian. You don't like that. We'll talk about that in a minute. You were a follower of the way of Jesus or the follower of the way. F-O-W. Don't, kind of glad we don't have that anymore. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him Saul Saul why do you persecute me he asked who are you Lord and the reply came I am Jesus whom you are persecuting but get up and enter the city and you will be told what to do the men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open he could see nothing So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. What do we call this? The conversion of Paul on the road. Thank you for saying that. I kind of pulled it out of you. Thirty years ago when my niece was about four, she learned about this in Sunday school. And um, I asked her, I said, "What what did you talk about in Sunday school? And she said, we, we talked about Paul seeing Jesus on the road to gymnastics. <laughs> She'd hate me telling that story, so don't, don't repeat it, please. Now, the story changes. Paul actually tells what happened to him three times. And the change in one version is minor. Uh, he says that um, they saw the light but didn't hear the... I mean, they... He has a different view on that. But the last time he talks about it, toward the end of Acts, there's an interesting addition that I just want you to see. This is in Acts 26, 14 through 18. 
When we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goats. I asked, who are you, Lord? The Lord answered, I am Jesus. What does it mean to kick against the goats? Anybody know? Oh, in English, it's sometimes called kick against the pricks. If you are, uh, and I know, I, I know the reason that you might not know. You don't have to herd oxen, do you? Anybody here herd oxen? I'd be disappointed if an oxen herder didn't know. You have a stick with a sharpened end and to make sure that ox keeps going down the path every now and then you need to kind of punch it with this stick now the ox can rebel against that by turning into it but it's going to hurt him even more so kicking against the goads meaning fighting against what my purpose is for you basically i'm trying to get you to go this way and you keep kicking against the way i want you to go Now, what could that tell us? I mean, the addition of this sentence, what could that say about Paul himself? It opens the possibility, at least, that Paul was already internally in turmoil about what he believed. In other words, he had somehow been enticed in some way by the Christian faith. Now, that's pure baloney, to be honest with you. And I don't mean bad baloney, because there is good baloney. But there's nothing to back that up except what people want to think, you know, and that means we start psychologizing Paul. And let me tell you something. One of the first things they teach you in seminary is never psychologize these people. You don't know, and I don't know. But it's an interesting phrase that kind of senses there was a tension already in Paul. Now, he is uh, taken into Damascus, and then he meets up with Ananias. And this is Acts 9, 10 through 18. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, uh, in a vision, what does that mean? Yeah, it's coming down from the Holy Spirit. Anan- Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen, in a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, we all want to obey the Lord, but there are limits, aren't there? And look what happens with Ananias. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he, 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 and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. It's almost like Ananias is saying to the Lord, say what? <laughs> what are you, are you crazy God? And no, and then he said, um, he said to him, go for he is an instrument whom I have chosen. And this is important to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. Remember at the beginning of Acts, Jesus talks about how they will spread the Christian faith in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then around the world. This is Paul's call, basically. These are the things that Paul is supposed to be uh, dedicating himself to. And, And so Ananias goes to him, and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. He then got up and was baptized and then received the Holy Spirit. Now that's interesting because this kind of formula is still the old-fashioned formula. Repent, believe, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. The interesting thing is that the Holy Spirit is always given within the community. And you can have experiences of the Holy Spirit that are individual. But you learn about it and get it from the community itself. So that's why we put our hands on people to symbolize, which we shouldn't symbolize, but which really stands for the idea that we are, in a sense, laying our hands on as an indication that this community, when you all ordain elders and deacons, how many of you all get up and stand around? Does it get a little crowded up there? I bet it does. And that's good. Even if you just put your hand on somebody else's shoulder, it travels right through. No, it doesn't actually travel through, but you... Now, the problem comes... A problem raises its ugly head here, and I want you to see it. 
And that is that Paul uh, has an entirely different understanding of what happened to him. And this is found not in Acts, but in Paul's letter to the Galatians. And he is super angry at the Galatians for falling back into circumcision when he writes them. But this is what he says about his own conversion. This is Galatians 1, 15 through 24. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles. And he's given God all the all the grace there. Get this, though. I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me. But I went at once away into Arabia. And afterwards, I returned to Damascus. Then three years, then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. And I stayed with Cephas, of course, is Peter. And stayed with him 15 days, but I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. And then he adds this. And what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. And then Galatians 1, 11 through 12. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now that's pretty different from what Acts has, where um, Paul receives his sight and goes directly to Jerusalem and meets with all the apostles and then goes off to Tarsus again. Now how are you going to explain this discrepancy and another one that's going to come up in a few minutes? It's a real problem. What you have to remember is that Galatians was written 40 years before Acts. It was written in the 50s. It's one of the earlier letters in the, in, in, in the 50s A.D. Acts was probably written about 90 A.D. So there's a 40-year span. And so Paul is protesting against something that he hasn't read in Acts because Paul never read Acts. He was dead by the time it got written. So what's going on here? And what is Paul trying to establish on his own? Was it possibly that Paul did not want any connection at all with the Jewish Christians? Was that the problem? He didn't want any real connection with the Jewish church? He gives the impression it was during the time that he was away, three years, that perhaps he kept talking to Jesus. He had all these mystical experiences that gave him a new understanding of what the faith meant, mean. Could it be that he is writing in the heat of a terrible controversy, which he was? It's these darn circumcising people that you have to watch out for. And Paul was convinced they were going to screw up the church. And so he spoke boldly against them in ways that were perhaps a little stronger than Luke has in the book of Acts 40 years later. Let me give you a couple of examples of that just to see if you can understand my strange logic here. I don't know whether any of y'all have been up to Virginia to see the Civil War battlefields. It was a big thing when I lived in Virginia. Well, if you go west toward Farmville, where beloved Hampton, Sydney, the college is, you go to Appomattox. And what happened in Appomattox? That's right. That's where Lee surrendered to Grant. There's a big sign in front of Welcome to... Appomattox, it says, Appomattox, where our nation was reunited. (laughs) I said, really? (laughs) And we see this kind of, and we all do this, so it's not, we want to paper over controversies and hard times, and we tend to smooth out the story to make it a little bit more palatable. Now, all of us today, I hope, believe that the Christian church is multiracial and welcomes all peoples of all races and nationalities. But if you go back to the 1950s and 1960s and get your hands on, in South Carolina, church minutes about how they're going to deal with African Americans showing up for church, it is a mess. 
It is angry and bitter. But we don't want to remember that. And so we say, isn't it wonderful how we include everybody now and nobody's upset about it. But it's hard to look back and see that. And so perhaps that's what he's doing here too. Any questions? Yeah. The, the, the twelve, you know, they were they had authority. All right. Uh, but Paul, who wasn't one of the twelve, um, you know, didn't have this direct connection with the human Jesus. Right. And so I imagine he's out there, you know, doing his thing and competing with other apostles, super apostles, whoever. He's trying to somehow get cred. Um, and so this, the what he says here in um, Galatians. Sounds like, you know, I got a, a direct source. That's right. And that's a, a good point because he doesn't fit the definition of an apostle. He never was with Jesus during his ministry on earth. And that's one of the requirements, if you remember. Yes. What do you know about into that's right. We don't know a thing. It, honestly. No, you're right. Except in Corinthians, he talks a little bit about he knows someone that went off into the desert and had these mystical experiences and went up to the third heaven. It's weird. (laughs) But most people think that's Paul talking about himself. And so, but you have to, again, interpret it that way to get that meaning out of it. And I think John's right, really, about the fact that I think Paul was very sensitive about the fact that he called himself an apostle, even though he did not meet the definition of what an apostle was. And so perhaps this extra time with Jesus or whatever he had was a real help to him. Thank you. That's very good. Any other questions? So did the other Christians ever accept that or did they No, and that's a very good question. Thank you. Because that's exactly what happened to the Jewish Christian church in Jerusalem. It failed and eventually died out. It was for economic reasons and for military reasons. The army came in, so the Christians, the Jewish Christians, left Jerusalem and went over to Pella across the Dead Sea. But they just shrank and finally, finally disappeared. They became heretics first. <laughs> they decided that Jesus was just a human, so they really didn't fit into the general run of things. But thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Now Barnabas, who was a Hebrew, a, a Jewish Christian, took Paul to his first church after all this. And that first church was in a town called Antioch, which is in the very uh, southeast corner of modern-day Turkey. And it was in Antioch that the followers of the way were first called Christians. And they did not like that name, but that was the name that stuck. Have you ever heard of a group that went by a name that stuck and they didn't like it? Any Methodists in here? Any, any former Methodists? Family? Okay. Where did, your, where did they get the name Methodists? They got it from their opponents because they were so rigid in their schedule and when they would go visit the poor and when they would go to, they were methodical. And so all their opponents said, those Methodists, it's like today if we had a church like this, we called them the obsessive compulsives or something. (laughs) And they wouldn't like being called obsessives either. But it shows you how a name can be given by somebody else and hang on. Now, Antioch, down there in the corner of Turkey, became the source where Paul did his missions. Now, the worst part of Acts and the worst part of studying, one of the big problems in studying Bible for students, in the Old Testament, it's all those laws. And in the New Testament, it's Paul's missionary journeys with all those maps with the lines over them. So I'm going to give you a quick tour that we don't have to cover anything like all the places that Paul went. And it follows a routine. It follows a very set routine. And I've outlined it here in their scripture passages to demonstrate this. But I'm not going to read those. I'm going to kind of skip over them. But I'm going to give you the plot line. Don't you like that when somebody gives you the plot line and you don't have to read the book? 
Read the book. Paul goes to any city, and the, and the one I use as an example is Perga. He goes there, and he goes directly to the synagogue. And while he's at the synagogue, he preaches to the Jews. And he tells them about the story of Jesus. And sometimes they're kind of receptive. And in this case, they invite him to come back the next week. But so many people showed up that it made the Jews jealous. And so they kicked them out. They basically, you can't be in my synagogue saying this kind of trash. And so they boot them out. And Paul always says, we were called to first go to the Jews. And when the Jews rejected us, we went to the Gentiles who received them. Remember, the Gentiles would be God-fearers, basically, who welcomed them. And the Gentiles started the church in each of the cities that Paul visited. Now, I want a quick aside here because I don't want you to think the Jews were bad people for kicking them out. So I'm going to defend the Jews here. Paul later says in the letter to the Romans, we need to recognize the Jewish people because they brought us to Christianity. If the Jews had not rejected Jesus, they would have embraced Jesus and it, never, it would have only been a cult of the Jewish faith. It is the fact that he goes to the Jews first, which is their logical path, and are rejected by them that the Gentiles, and that's most of us, are saved. So we owe them a debt of gratitude. And Paul talks about this at great length. They, the Jewish people, are beloved by God to this day because of their suffering, and their suffering included rejections like they did with Christians. Okay. And then, just to end the story, after he talks to the Gentiles, the, um, he gets kicked out of town. <laughs> He's on his way to the next town. And it goes that same pattern. You can follow the same pattern in every different city that he, he uh, meets. And then he goes back home after talking to all these churches, all of them in Asia, in Turkey. All of them in the area of Turkey. But as soon as he gets back to Antioch, he runs into the circumcision party, the Jewish Christians. And they have been down to that church, and Paul explains in some detail exactly what was happening in Acts 15, 1 through 3. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, quote, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate uh, with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and elders. This is the first church council. Now in the days before popes had power and before the Protestant Reformation, really the first 700 years of the Christian faith All problems were settled in this way. Councils. They came together and discussed the problem and tried to come to an answer. So if you ever look at Chalcedon or um, any of the other, the the Nicene Creed was done by a council. So you know that's the way they made the, the decision. Now, let's be clear. Who cares about circumcision? If anybody wants any medical advice on circumcision, any doctors here, they, you know, I can, I've read, but I'm not going to talk about it, about what's better and what's not these days, but apparently it changes every few years anyway. That's not the issue that we're discussing here. The fact is, it's a struggle on trying to decide whether the Christianity is simply going to remain a sect of, the, of Jews or whether it's going to be open to other people who do not follow the laws of of, uh, of Judaism. And so it's basically an evangelical question. But it is also an important statement about faith. Circumcision is a human work. In other words, your father and mother and the, and the rabbi would circumcise you. That's a human act to bestow grace upon you. And Paul and Christianity were early believers, as as you've already seen, that you're not saved by what you do. 
You are not saved by your works. You are saved only by the grace of God. And so to throw up any work is to ask, it weakens the whole concept of faith. And that is the major issue that comes up. And Peter's speech, which is in Acts 15, at the Jerusalem conference, shows that. He says, um, the apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter of circumcision. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message. That's Peter saying that. Remember, he baptized Cornelius. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and cleansing their hearts by faith. He has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test? Boy, that's good. By placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. And then the final sentence, which brings home the point that both Luke and Paul like. On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. And they reach a compromise. Isn't that the way you do things? And the compromise is, and this is made by the leader of the Jerusalem church, James. And James decides that what they will do is they will, uh, they will permit people to come into the faith who are not circumcised. But, here's the compromise, they still have to obey the kosher laws. That's, that's some compromise. Because you still got the problem of works. And Paul, writing 40 years earlier, is adamant against this conclusion of what happened. So let's look at that. Galatians 2, 1 through 2, and 4, verses 4 through 14. Then after 14 years, and that would be 14 years after he first visited Jerusalem, and when nailed down the Jerusalem council to about 60 A.D., I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking Titus along with me. I went up in response to a revelation. It doesn't explain what that is. But I laid before them, though by only in a private meeting with the acknowledged leaders, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. And here comes the sinister part. But because false believers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy on the freedom we have in Christ, Jesus, so they might enslave us. Who are they? Jewish Christians. They are Christians. They are Christians who believe in circumcision. And he sees them as people that are trying to steal away our faith in in what it is. But he says... But because of false believers secretly brought in who slipped into spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus so that they might enslave us, we did not submit to them even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might always remain with you. And from those who were supposed to be acknowledged leaders, here comes a, here comes, here comes a zinger. What they actually were makes no difference to me. God chose no partiality. See, he's not going to recognize them really as as leaders. Those leaders contributed nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter has been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised, whoa, that's absolutely backwards because in the Acts account, it makes Peter the hero and not Paul. Peter is the one that goes to the Gentiles. For he who worked through Peter, making him an apostle to the circumcised, also worked through me in sending me to the Gentiles. And that's not the end of the story. Because something else bad happens that Paul is angry about. And when James and Peter and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and, and they to the circumcised. They asked only one thing, nothing about kosher laws, that we remember the poor, 
which is what we actually intended to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. When Peter came to our church, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James in Jerusalem, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, when no Jews are around, and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? And here's the kicker again. We know that a person is justified by the works, is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law. Because no one will be justified by the works of the law. Now that's right into, that's, in, that's Paul's heated struggle at the time it was happening. And it could very easily be two things. It could be that Acts is covering over the extent of the... It's good for us to see, by the way, how angry they get with each other so we can be angry with each other sometimes. I'm all for that. It not only permits that, but it shows you how uh, much uh, we rely on Paul to be the kind of Christian church we are today. Now, I'm going to defend Luke for a minute in this book. It could be that he never in his lifetime saw... Paul's letter to the Galatians. Now, Paul's letter to the Galatians, as I told you, was actually written 40 years before all of this. But the letters did not circulate until about the year 100 A.D. when a bishop in Turkey went around to the churches and gathered all the letters and put them into a volume. And so it could easily be that that the author of Luke Acts doesn't have complete information that won't be available for another 10 years, perhaps. That was the major struggle that was uncovered with the missionary journeys and one of the major ones to be resolved in the early church. It was the first crisis of the church. Any questions? I'm sorry, I need to tell Yeah. Question or maybe a thought. The, um, it, it seems like there's not just the, the Jesus followers, but it seems like all the Jews are having this um, this uh, problem following the Torah because uh, the temple's torn down. Now, yeah. Uh, so if they're trying to be mosaic, you know, following right. the law, and, uh, and they can't, but they don't have this uh, this temple. Um, you know, sacrifice priestly type system. Um, so they were having a. a they were strong. Yeah, that's right. Well no. The, the Jesus followers were having a crisis. You know, were trying to follow this right. Torah. And it seemed like nobody was able to follow the Torah. But then there were, you know, we read in Matthew that Jesus didn't come to, to do away with the Torah. So right. it seems like we have these different perspectives on oh yes isn't that wonderful we have more than one perspective and john is absolutely right we sure do and let me tell you a secret that not many people will tell you but it is really true if you read matthew matthew is not a real fan of paul (laughs) in fact there's a school of thought that maybe matthew is trying to answer some of the elements of what paul has raised we don't notice them but they're there that Paul would never, would never agree with. And so it raises a real problem in a sense, but it's great because it shows us how much wiggle room you have. What's your view of Christianity? I will guarantee you it's not the same of, as mine. I'm the only one that really gets the Christian religion. <laughs> and I hope to a certain extent you feel that way as well. Because you have molded the faith to fit your needs and what is important to you in life. We have the basics together, and that's what matters. The essentials, as our church fathers call them. And so we don't get hung up if people disagree with some of them. 
and we try to get along as best we can and hug each other and say we all believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that's wonderful. But you're exactly right. The temple was not destroyed until 60 AD. So it was certainly gone by the time Luke wrote and that was a real upsetting of the apple cart because then the Pharisees went out against the Christians because they're troublemakers and we need to solidify the faith. But it was a struggle. Absolutely, John. Any other questions? The second missionary journey was Paul's decision to go out and visit, revisit the churches he saw the first time. It was a good idea because he wanted to tell them what had been decided at the Jerusalem Council and everything was okay. And so he starts out and immediately Barnabas says, I'm not going with you. They had a tiff. And Paul says the tiff was caused by a young man named John Mark who had uh, jumped ship on the first missionary journey and gone home. You know, they didn't play rock and roll where he was or something, where they were going. So he didn't, he wanted to go back to the jukebox maybe. I don't know. But he went home. He went back home. And now Barnabas, according to Acts, wants to take him with him. And Paul says, I'm not having anything to do with that punk anymore. And um, they had a big fight. And Barnabas went off on his own. And uh, um, Paul took Silas. This is where Silas, if you've ever heard the name Silas. Now, what's a better ex- explanation of why Barnabas didn't go, go with Saul? It's been told to us. Did it sneak by you? Even he was led astray. He was a led astray. Asl- exactly. Well done. He was led astray by the circumcision party. And so it might be just another illustration of how deep and how long they struggled over this issue. Yeah. But Barnabas' father a Jew, I thought they were sort of a mixed marriage. You know, I don't know what his heritage is. The name Barnabas is a Hebrew name. I do know that. His mother was Jewish, obviously. Yeah, and that would do it. Now, oh, for sure. Now, what's interesting is Silas is a Greek name. So, just worth noting, can't read anything into that, but it seems purpose. So, he goes out and he goes up to to, uh, Turkey to revisit these places, and the Holy Spirit won't let him get there. What's wrong? I'm just going back to my churches. It keeps pushing him west. Go west, go west. Until they finally get to the city of Troas on the coast of the Aegean Sea. And there Paul has a vision. And it's this Gentile saying, come over, we need your help in Macedonia. And so they get on a ship and they travel over. And this is what makes you and I Christians to this day. Because it brought the Christian faith, which was a Western religion... And, I mean, an Eastern religion, it was an Oriental religion and from Israel and made it Western. And it made it Western because there were so many Christians in Asia and Turkey and in Europe. That's where the largest populations of Christians were for 500 years uh, in Turkey and then in, straight across into Europe. That's one reason we are Christian. And it's another reason. Another reason is what happened 600 years later, about 600 A.D. And that was the Muslim invasions. Now, unfortunately, the Christian churches in North Africa and in Egypt were easy pickings because they had already broken away from the main group of Christians. They had already separated. Have you ever heard of a Coptic Christian? There are some other branches that are still hanging on in North Africa and even in uh, the Mediterranean Sea area to the north, but they're not major players. And so basically, the eastern part of the empire was cut away from the Christian church so that these were the churches that, uh, that really survived. Now, does anybody remember any stories from the second missionary journey? We got all the letters just about from that. You know, there was the letter to the, uh, the people that lived in Thessalonica. What letter was that? Thessalonians. Ephesus? Very good. Corinth? 
That's right. So we know he established churches. There were others. We know he established churches in all these places because he wrote letters to them. And, and the book of Acts explains how he comes to each one and basically follows the same pattern of ultimately getting in trouble uh, with, the, um, with the different uh, Jewish, with the synagogue or with the business people. Christianity is not good for business. Twice he gets kicked out because of his um, interfering with business. Have you ever heard any of those stories? One was a silversmith in Ephesus, and he couldn't sell his, uh, his little trinkets for the, guard, the god, goddess Artemis anymore because everybody was laughing them off. And so he went, to the, he went to the chief justice and said, Get this man out of here. He's ruining my business. And that worked. Remember the slave girl that he ran, to, ran into when he went to Corinth? And she kept following after him. I love this story about Paul. Kept following after him and saying she was a prophetess. She was a slave and a prophetess. She went around saying, these men are slaves of the almighty God. And she kept yelling it and yelling it. Well, you can tell from the letters that Paul doesn't have a very patient streak. He loses his temper sometimes. And finally, after this woman had been screaming, oops, after this woman had been scream, screaming at him for I don't know how many days, he turns around and says, demon be gone. And within an hour, she can't prophesy anymore. Boy, was her owner ticked off. And so he got him kicked out. So watch out. And... He completes the second missionary journey and then goes up, goes ahead and does a third missionary journey, which is basically just living in Ephesus and visiting all the churches round about. So it is not especially uh, noteworthy because it basically keeps the same concept going. After Paul had been in Ephesus probably about three years, after three years, he told his followers he was going to Jerusalem. Now, who else in Luke Acts has gone to Jerusalem? Nope, earlier than that. Jesus. Remember, we did that long journey of uh, road to Jerusalem. Paul imitates that almost. And all the churches say, don't go back, you will be killed. Paul had a reason. He wanted to give money to the Jerusalem church, which was hard up financially by this time. And he wanted to try to mend fences. But it didn't work. And when he was arrested in Jerusalem, he was uh, brought before the high council. And do you know what he told, told them? This is tricky. Good old Paul. I am a Pharisee. And these, these Sadducees are out to get me. So the whole council erupts in a ride. And the Romans don't know what to do with him. They know he's a Roman citizen and they need to protect him. So they finally take him down to the seacoast where he remains for two years waiting for the governor to decide what to do. When the governor says, I'm going to take you back myself to Jerusalem to stand trial, Paul says no. He knows it means certain death if that happens. And so he pulls the ultimate card from his wallet. I am a Roman, I appeal to the emperor. And the minute he says that, although all the Romans say, well, you're really probably innocent and we can get you off. No, he's not going to do that. The moment he appeals to the emperor, he has to be carried to Rome. And so that's how he gets to Rome. He's a prisoner all the way, all the time that he is, he is there. Any questions about the jurisprudence of the Roman courts. <laughs> Good. <laughs> when he is in, uh, and I've skipped, I've skipped Bible verses that I hope you will read, not during the sermon today, but sometime in the future. I do want to say a couple of things, but I do want to leave time, and I promised myself I'd leave 10 minutes to see if you all have any questions or if there's anything we can draw from these six weeks, Okay. I want you to see what it says at the end. Uh, Acts 28, 30 through 32. He lived in Rome. He lived there two whole years at his own expense, which means that he was under house arrest, basically. And welcomed all who came to him, 
proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. The end. Now, why does he end it there? What does, he, what does Luke Acts know about what ultimately happened to Paul? No, he knows. He knows that ultimately he's executed by the Romans, beheaded. He knows that. Why didn't he put it here? Who wants that kind of ending? <laughs> when I was a kid, when I was a kid, my favorite was Davy Crockett. Did we all, did we all have coon skin caps? Oh, yeah. And it was, a, it was on uh, Walt Disney on black and white television. And I'll never forget that last episode. There they are in the Alamo fighting off those Mexicans. And they run out of ammunition. And they run out of everything. And Jim Bowie has been killed. And, and, and suddenly there's a picture of Davy Crockett with old Betsy. Remember old Betsy? His gun. And he doesn't even have any ammunition anymore. And he's swinging it back and forth, back and forth. And then suddenly... They start playing uh, the Texas something, and the flag gets the Texas flag waves. And I turned to my little brother and said, "What happened? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Walt Disney wanted us to see Davy Crockett get killed? I don't think so. And perhaps that's that's one good reason. And also, he doesn't want to give people the impression that the Romans are bad guys." And they're the ones that killed Jesus, actually. And they're the ones who killed Paul, actually. But he recognizes the importance of keeping the idea that both these men were innocent so that the idea that they could live within the Roman Empire and the kingdom that extended ahead. That's six long weeks. Now, let me say a couple of words, because one of the things that does bug me a little bit is we can talk about this, but what does it mean for us today? The way I think the church succeeded was being wide open, open arms, welcoming. And welcoming means more than putting a sign out front that says, come and worship with us. The people in the community have got to reach out to people that are like them, certainly we want to do that, but also leave room for people that are not like us, that are different, and we've got to be willing to say, come on in, in a way that means something, in a way that people can understand, and it's just not platitudes. The church's role, it seems to me, is to be inclusive. Our job and if you want to go back to the wheat and tares, it's a perfect example. We collect everything. We collect it all. And we want it all in our midst. Because we can help people that don't fully understand yet. We can help people in need better that way. The exclusion belongs solely to God. We have no business excluding people from our midst without some really serious reason for doing so. And I'm not saying anything goes, for heaven's sakes, but I'm saying the problem is not that a bunch of derelicts, although we should welcome a few, are coming here. It's the problem that we are scared to reach out to people that are substantially different than we are. And that's the key for, it seems to me, if I was going to suggest it, but it's hard as the blazes to do. Because it makes people uncomfortable. People might not dress right for church. Maybe you've gotten past that. I've noticed that everybody dresses a little bit more casually these days. But we've got to think of ways to draw people in. Even if it means changing some of the ways we do worship. This is a whole other lecture series that I'm working on. What can we do to make ourselves more appealing without compromising our essential beliefs? That's where I think we would draw the line. I mean them. <laughs> okay, tell me what any any last minute thoughts that you might have. Yes. Uh, when uh, Paul went into Jerusalem, at that point, were his people like Northern Jerusalem? Were they still Jewish? Were they still Jewish? 
and I, I don't know what the count would be, but he's definitely in a majority of circumcised Christians within Jerusalem when he went to, and that's why they were scared for him to go because they didn't like him. They might have been willing to kill him because he was violating the rules of Moses. And that's what they preached. And we don't want that in the Christian faith. We want to keep the law and keep Jesus. But they were wary of the fact that he was growing in popularity. I think they just want, they wanted to be rid of him. And if he had not been protected by the Rome, Romans, he would have been killed, according to Acts. It's what saved him. Thank you. You've been good today. Any other questions? Yes. Why? Because of a guy named Nero. I mean, the major Roman persecution, he just happened to be there when it happened. And Nero's persecution was in 68. Uh, First time Christians were burned. We know that, uh, again, Paul was protected. Peter probably was killed about the same time. And you know, the old, there's no proof of this. It's not in the Bible about Peter being crucified upside down. Well, see, he's, a, he's not a Roman citizen. And so he would be crucified. Now, what position he was in, I don't know. But uh, Paul would never be crucified. And so we assume that he was beheaded. So is there outside information that says Paul was killed? Uh, no, there is not. So that's just... Uh, sure, I mean, we, we, yeah. as soon as I finish Acts, I'm dealing with sources that are not foolproof anymore. And of course, we consider Scripture foolproof to the extent that we, it's a basis of our faith. But even there, you're not positive, as, you, as you've seen in the disagreements. So he may have died of old. That's right, and there's some people that think he left Rome after two years and went to Spain for a while, but there's no record of that at all. And then came back to Rome and got killed. And I just, I skipped that because I'm not sure it happened. (laughs) And there's no place to know. There are several church, there are several gospels and stories that kind of spin uh, yarns about the apostles other than uh, the book of Acts, which is essentially about Peter and Peter and Paul. Um, but they're so far-fetched, and of course they were never accepted into Scripture. So we can look at them if, you're, if we're interested, but we always look at them with a, a little pinch of salt. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. That's a question. It's not exactly on the subject, but is there any relationship between the seven churches in the uh, Revelation yeah. and the letters of Paul? Some. Some they're not. It's not one on one, but there are th- those churches actually did exist. We know, and are called out pretty much. And and John, but then uh, Revelation was probably written about a hundred, uh, ten years after all of this, when the persecutions were becoming more severe, especially in Turkey, Asia Minor, and so they're responding to that and trying to tell the churches to get their acts together. But that's, thank you. That's a good, any questions, good. And we got two minutes. Yes. I've always been, um, I don't know what the right word is, buffalo. Oh, that's a good word. Buffalo. Say um, that John and Peter were so uneducated, and yet their sermons were brilliant. Right. And they were absolute quotes. Right. From the old. Yes. They knew. Mm-hmm. I mean, so what would be, I mean, now they maybe weren't educated as far as astronomy was concerned or whatever, but they were not. Yeah, we don't even know whether they uh, were able to read. We're not sure any of these people. Paul, we know, he wrote. He said, look what big letters I write when I write in my own hand. He was carried away in Galatians and so did that. But you're right, and there's no indication of that, except if they were raised in Judaism, they memorized passages of Scripture from the prophets and from the Torah. So how is that unschooled? It isn't. I'd say uneducated by my standard. <laughs> well, I'm that. No, we're, we're all uneducated in the wisdom that matters. So that's, a, that's probably the best way to think about it. Blessings on you all. Thank you so much for a wonderful time.
just going to say a quick thank you to um, Peter. For those of you that don't know, he is a huge Braves fan, and one of his favorite pastimes is sitting and scoring. <gasps> oh, did you find games. Oh. Uh, You know, each game, he does it for each game, and it's actually a way to make baseball fun, which is hard to do. <laughs> Some great Pins. pins and a scoring. Oh, my goodness. For, uh, preaching for us in the sixth Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.